reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Joe, uh, I have a question that I'd like to ask you. I've read many mysteries, probably hundreds, maybe thousands of mysteries over the years. It's sort of a traditional avocation of librarians who lead very dull lives and probably have to escape into the fantasy world of books. Um, many times I have read mysteries, gone through them and said, I could write something better than this, but I haven't done it uh, for whatever reason. And Probably the best reason is found in a, a great song by the British team Flanders and Swan. Um, there's a character, the Sloth, who says, I could have done this, I could have done that, I could have been a famous professor and so on, but I just don't have the time. <laughs> How did you, as a police chief, uh, as a PhD and so on, find the time yeah, to write mystery? Very much like that. Um, I loved mysteries from the time I was a boy, and then I spent all these years in policing, and I had the same thought. I could do better, and in fact, I occasionally did a book review because as police chief, the newspaper once in a while would ask me to review a book, and I reviewed a book by a very famous mystery writer, I shall, shall not mention his name, but he had written some 37 books on the police, and I thought his book was terrible. And being kind of a wiseacre New Yorker, I, my last line in the book review was to the reader, a savior 1295, I'm writing my own cop novel in revenge. <laughs> and then I found out how hard it, it is. And I also found that it was great therapy for me because as a big city police chief, you're surrounded by frustrations and pressure. And I work for politicians, uh, some of whom were not the kind of people we would love to have lead us and represent us in a democracy. I had to deal with the police union, the news media, this group, that group, and lawyers. <laughs> and so uh, this was a kind of therapy. My characters were able to say things about all of this that I couldn't say as police chief. In fact, in one of the books, the police chief, the, the last one, the Blue Mirage, is about a police chief. And he's complaining so much about politicians that one of his aides says, now chief, remember, we can't have a democracy without them. <laughs> and it is something I think we Americans all need to remind ourselves of. And I love to write about that conflict where in a democracy, the police must be under civilian control, the military and the police. But who are the civilians? They're the people that gave us Watergate and all of the other scandals and their ideals and standards of ethics are not what we expect from a professional law enforcement. And so we always have that conflict that the police authority can be misused for, for corrupt or political purposes, as it has continuously throughout our history. Did you, when you were young, have a particular kind of mystery you liked, or detective story? Oh, was that yeah. something that was your favorite? Yeah, I loved, of course, Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler, the hard-boiled hard private eye type. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that's what I tried to combine mm -hmm. in my books. It's, it's somewhat of a police procedural, but it also has aspects of that hard-boiled style with a little unique uh, McNamara cop humor thrown in. Because the cop humor is unique. Uh, <coughs> in a sense, it's like MASH. You know, police do see so much violence that like doctors and nurses and emergency personnel, they must build up a little wall there. And uh, that's where that kind of humor comes into it to sort of protect yourself from what you're seeing all the time. 
I must say I keep getting ideas for mystery stories, which I never do anything with, but they are. Uh, I always dream of you know killing off certain people at least by, <laughs> by way of books. It's legal homicide. <laughs> See, you want to do you you want the therapeutic route like he did. That's yeah. what you're thinking about. Uh, doing. I've got a great title for you. How about Murder in the Tower? <laughs> Believe it or not, that title has been suggested. We, we're sitting right next to the Hoover Tower, which is full of books and right. mysterious. Well, Margaret Truman shafts. has yeah. been very successful with her she series, has. Murder Here, Murder, murder in there, the, the White Supreme House, Court, and the FBI, the, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court. Right, and uh, that's. Uh, what kind do you like best, Gloria? Well, I'm a. F w Given the fact that you've been talking about all of these hard-boiled mysteries, uh, detective stories, and the procedurals, I have a tendency to like the British stories, the whodunit, the right. body in the library, and everybody gathered at the end with an amateur detective most likely having solved it. Yeah, you know, there's, there's some Those great are the cozy yeah. kind, like Agatha that. Agatha Christie and John Dickerson Carr, yeah. the, the locked room. The, the locked room uh, mysteries. Mysteries, right. Also, um, one person I like, and I don't know whether Ed does, is uh, Anne Perry, who sets hers yes. in the Victorian period. And uh, I've rather enjoyed those, because you do have a policeman there and solving it. You also find out that uh, um, things can be very difficult. A policeman can be fired at any time. He's got to be real careful when he's dealing with the privileged classes. Uh, it's very, I think it's more difficult than it is in the 20th That's century. That's true, yeah. And the English, no uh, backup. The, the, the interesting thing is some of the, the real attraction in those mysteries is the way in which the story is at one level, but the uh, exposure and the education on the English class system mm -hmm. is so different. I had good luck uh, at one point in my life to be a visiting professor at Brams Hill Police Staff College for three months in England, which is kind of the West Point of English policing. Mm -hmm. And they really are different. I, I have to say that by American standards, it was shocking because when they had a homicide, they actually assigned about 31 detectives to the case. Of course, they have so little violent crime by comparison to our country. And I said, they said, well, how do, uh, Mac, how does it go in America? And I said, well, we get another homicide. We say, hey, Smith and Jones, you got another one. Go on out. Two, it's only two officers? We have an officer in charge of keeping the log and doing this and doing that. And I said, well, unfortunately, that's a luxury that uh, American police forces don't have because the level of violence is so great. And I suppose, in a way, as much as I love the English uh, mysteries and genre, uh, it always seemed to me a little unreal because they have so few murders there compared to this country where we're just inundated with violence. Yeah, they set up a crime scene immediately and cordon off the mm -hmm. place. And I thought what I was reading was just simply part of the fiction. I didn't realize they did that in real life, not having, of course, had the contact that you have with the uh, English police. But the class uh, system of it was, was so impressive to me. You know, we Americans are so egalitarian. And we would have this formal dinner every two weeks where we all wore... Uh, black tie uh, outfits and, and we'd all toast to the queen and so on and at one point this rather high-ranking English official nudged me and he said do you see that chap up there and I looked and there was this wealthy businessman sitting at the head table and he said he plays polo with the royal family I said oh <laughs> <laughs> but they're quite uh, conscious of the class system and it does, you know, our origins of American policing come from England. The first police force was in 1829 in London, Sir Robert Peel, mm -hmm. called the Bobbies. And they Bobby's were the model for a lot of years and it was copied in the first police force in New York City in 1845 after the Bobbies and then four years later in 1849 in Boston. The difference was the cities in America were under corrupt political control of Tammany Hall type machines. And so the model in England of this uh, high level of integrity, when it was transformed to America, the heritage of American policing is one of brutality, corruption, 
and use of the police for political purposes. If you study the history of New York City, whoever controlled the police force won the election for mayor <laughs> <laughs> up until the 1900s or so. And some people claim that that hasn't changed that much in cities like <laughs> Chicago and <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> this business of seeing the class structure in the reflected in the books and learning about it, getting a feeling from it, is one of the things that I like about mystery stories very much. I got into reading mysteries fairly late. Uh, I didn't like them as when I was a kid. I didn't like them very much when I was a teenager. I still don't like the, the locked room puzzle no. type mysteries. My mind doesn't work that way. I can never remember when so-and-so <coughs> was supposed to be in room A or not in <laughs> state room B in time to drop the poison into the cup. Mm. But I, my mind glazes over until I get to the end of the book mm. and then it sort of wakes well, up again. Some of the great, the, uh, I don't know if you read W.R. Burnett. Uh, he, no. some, I'm sure you've seen his movies because Bogart played in a, a lot of them, Edward G. Robinson, and they're really classics going back into the 30s, and they tell you a lot about America at the time, about the underworld and about the uh, political control of the police and the cities and the corruption. Uh, even the great movie Chinatown, you know, brings you back to a time mm -hmm. where the theme in many of those books uh, was the uh, the cops uh, were there, but they were always sort of under corrupt control, and the private eye was able to weave through that somehow. This independent person with his or her, her own, uh, mostly his, come to think of it, <laughs> sense okay. of professionalism. Uh, the Maltese Falcon. Do you remember the great line in the Maltese Falcon uh, where Sam Spade says, you know, maybe I'm not as crooked as I pretend to be. There aren't many rules in this business, but when your partner gets killed, you have to uh, do something, and that's why I'm sending you down, sweetheart. <laughs> and he puts the arrest arrest Bridget O'Shaughnessy and she says, oh Sam you couldn't do that and he said yeah <laughs> well my first book my editor and I had a long fight he wanted me to have the detective arrest uh, his lover yes. in the book and mm -hmm. uh, I won't in case people haven't read it I won't uh, read it. <laughs> I won't disclose the ending but the title of it uh, is people say, where do you get the title from the first directive? And uh, I shouldn't tell the story, perhaps. No, you shouldn't, because you're going to spoil it for the other well, people the who want to read is, it. Well, the truth is, he told me, you know, we have a deadline on a Friday. He said, and we're going into our publicity Monday morning. Think of a title for the book. I had just never thought of a title for the first directive. And, uh, of course, there's a three-hour difference in California time. He calls me at 7 in the morning. It's 10 o'clock in New York, and I'm asleep like this. And he said, I've got a title. What do you think of the first directive? And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, it's got this and it's got that, you know, all of the jargon of the publishing industry. I said, but what does it have to do with the book? And he said, that doesn't matter. <laughs> and I said, well, hold on. It does to me. I have to go on all the talk shows. <laughs> People say, what does that mean? So I said, let me think about it. And I called him back and I said, I'll tell you what. I'll use it if you'll let me include this paragraph. One of the themes of this was that this veteran detective falls in love with this beautiful woman and she's involved in his case and that's a no-no. You're not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. But of course the cops are human. They do it all the time in real life and it drove me crazy as police chief. But as a novelist it was great. And I said, uh, I'll have this guy say at one point, I knew I was violating the first directive of mm -hmm. police work not to get involved with a woman in your case. But that was written in after the title. <laughs> That's sort of like John McDonald's uh, books, his color yeah, series. Yeah, color yeah. Where he would series, yes. write the book, then think of the color, and color. Then yes. think of a line that would have to go. There, there are some writers, you know, who think of the title first and then do the book. There are other writers who think of a scene and then the book flows from there. And there are other writers who outline every chapter. It's a fascinating thing. There's no right method. I mean, everyone that I talk to and going around says much what you do Ed that gosh I have a book in me I want to write a book and it's very interesting I mean here at Hoover with some of the greatest scholars in the world that I envy and I studied so much in graduate school and they come up to me and they said you're a novelist uh, I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them do attempt to write That's mysteries, right, yeah. or have written, because there is <clears throat> Marshall Jevons, uh, who writes, have written three, 
And, yeah, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a great challenge. I mean, because what happens is you, you have like a murder, you want someone murdered and you see the scene. <laughs> and for me, uh, as police chief, I had so many anecdotes and, and stories that happened during my career in three major American cities, New York, Kansas City, and San Jose. And it's, it's a great story. You tell it to people and they say, gosh, what a story. And then you sit down and you write it and it's as flat as a pancake. And that's the difference. I don't, I think you can learn a lot about how to write, but there are some people who are wonderful writers, scholastic books or nonfiction books, and then they try fiction and it just doesn't translate. It's a different kind of writing. I had done a lot of nonfiction writing before I tried uh, my first novel, and I found uh, that it was quite different. Basically, the one thing to keep in mind is you have one obligation, and that's to tell a story that interests the reader, to entertain. And people forget. You know, you can educate a little bit in the better books, the ones that stay with us, that I like and that we remember, are things we learned something about the class system or the political system or the medical system, medical work or universities or government or police bureaucracies or, or the law. And that's what's red hot right now, of course, uh, yeah. uh, law firms. Or you can do like Dorothy Sayers and take uh, one topic and treat it in a book. You know, the ringing of church bells and the nine tailors. There's one of hers that isn't as popular where it has to, all to do with autopsies. Mm, yes. I learned all I wanted to. Well, and I've, more. I've, I've watched a couple, and I don't know I if know, I'd like that you've book. had to be. Right, that's why I said it was more than I wanted. Actually, there's a new author, a current author, who writes about autopsies, and I find that she is one of the best mystery authors going right, right. now. That's Patricia the one Cornwell. Out, out, yeah. out east, or, yes. or it's supposed to be a uh, coroner uh, in Virginia, exactly. the character, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, fascinating mysteries plus a lot of technical information about what goes on in autopsies, things that you would never have imagined, using mm -hmm. lasers and so on to look for fine pieces of lint and so on on, on bodies. Yeah, I, I think uh, in a way I have <coughs> another confession to make that um, I got into a lot more of what we refer to as criminalistics in, in law enforcement, uh, which is forensic science of processing evidence as an author than I ever did as an officer. <laughs> but with fiber analysis and, and uh, the use of computers uh, to examine latent fingerprints and so on, the technology is fascinating. And I think one of the reasons writers like Tom Clancy are so successful uh, in his books on, on war is that he uh, satisfied that hunger that we have by sort of treating us to the inside information when you read it. I remember a few years ago uh, flying or doing a tour out at Moffett Field where they fly the P-3s and the, uh, the naval officer who showed us around, at the first question he said is, have you read The Hunt for the Red October? Because that's just about the way it is. Clancy yeah. did an amazing oh, job. Oh, he did. I mean, that and was so, incredible. Uh, you know, you forgive some other stuff in the writing, the characterization isn't all that deep and that kind of stuff, and the critics tore him apart, but the public loved it. Oh, yes, I loved it, even with all of the technical jargon in it. But I began to feel that uh, the uh, sea was not only filled with amoeba, but also with an enormous number of submarines. <laughs> I wonder if they didn't why they didn't have more collisions. <laughs> well, they're still flying missions out of here. I don't know what they're looking for now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of those subs got lost. <laughs> I don't know. I think we, we still don't trust the Russians, yeah. basically. Well, we don't know what they're doing. Well, some of the m most interesting mysteries I've read, I've, I've read mysteries that have a lot of technical stuff in them that are fabulously interesting. I've read others that have absolutely none, which are enormously mm -hmm. good. The Judge D mysteries, for example, of Robert Van Gulick taking place in medieval China, where mm -hmm. there's practically no technology of any sort. A, a murder is accomplished by a, a woman driving a, a hat pin into a mm -hmm. man's head. For yeah, example, and the other, the judge what was the that. one that uh, Sean Connery played in the movie, uh, the uh, Rose? Uh, I know, you, Robert the name uh, of the Echoes. Rose. Uh, the, uh, yes. the, uh, the, the Name of the Rose. The Name of the Rose, yes. yeah. Echoes book, yeah. Very well done. And I, I comes back to what I was saying earlier. I think that despite the technology, uh, the reader 
turns the page. The trick is to get the reader to be interested enough Story. in the people. I don't even like to use the word character because it's depersonalized. Yeah. To, you must make the character interesting enough so, and it can be a bad person too, but not too bad, so that we turn the page. Uh, it has to interest us to see what's going to happen to these people next. And when I started to write my mysteries, I didn't have a, an ending in sight. I just said, I want to put these three police officers through their paces and to show the public what kind of tension can build up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I did that, and then I came to the point where I had 400 pages of a manuscript, and I said, I have to end this thing. <laughs> there are only so many possibilities for an ending. And I said, you can have a tragic ending, a sad ending, a happy ending, ironic ending, and so on. And I was jogging around the track thinking, how do I end this? These characters keep getting into more and more trouble and more and more uh, intrigue, I must end this book. And then I remembered uh, seeing Ingrid Bergman on a talk show, and I always loved her as an actress, and she, she uh, talked about Casablanca, and she had that wonderful musical laugh, and she laughed, and she said they called it such a great classic. And she said, you know, we didn't even have an ending. We shot two endings. One, she went with Humphrey Bogart, who was her lover. Mm -hmm. The other one that they used, of course, is she stayed with her husband. And so I took that and I said, look, you know, end the book, even Casablanca. <laughs> don't, don't get so hung up over it. And, and I, I made up my mind and I ended the book that night. But it's interesting what you said about you don't want to call them characters, you want to call them people. I know I particularly enjoy those writers who carry the same people throughout. You get interested in mm -hmm. them, like the uh, nameless detective uh, Franzini's. Yes, right. And he ends, and you do want to see the next book because of something that happened, and he will tell you the resolution of it. Mm -hmm. And you really feel like he's a person. I mean, you, you know, know, you don't think of him as a character. You know, it's, it's quite true, and you think about that as a writer. I used a series, and I had my first three books the same. The first one, the uh, main character starts out as a sergeant, and then the second book gets in so much trouble, he gets <laughs> kicked up to chief of detectives. And then finally, uh, he was very anti-brass. And of course, I've been a police chief for a long time. He's getting on my nerves with all that anti-brass stuff. So I thought, I'll fix his wagon. And the third book, I made him police chief, just yes. to show it's not that I easy. I know, I opened it up and he's police chief. I was shocked. I haven't had a chance to finish it yet. I went, what? <laughs> well, I won't tell you the answer. Oh, no, please don't. <laughs> I, I really like reading the series of, of mysteries as well. The, very, the ones that develop a character or a series of characters. Um, there, there are just so many of them that are extremely good. But on, you, you talked about ending the book, and I can remember years ago reading, I still remember the, this one particular book, one of uh, Dick Francis's early books, mm -hmm. if not his first, Flying Finish. Uh, the, the action in that book gets really gets fast and furious toward the end. And I can remember sitting there reading it and sort of flipping the pages <laughs> as I was reading it. And all of a sudden, I flipped the page and there wasn't anything else. And it was a terrible feeling. Because yeah. I, I just wanted it that is. story. It really is. When you, know, you, you have a good book, you want to get to the climax, but on the other hand, you don't, you don't want, want it to end. end. I want to say one thing about series that you may never have thought of that maybe only writers get to learn. I found after I did my series with my characters that there's a certain cost to doing that, even though it's nice for the readers like mm -hmm. it and you may sell more books, that if you sell one of those books to a movie, you've sold all three. You've and so it. a lot of writers uh, say, even though you can see a continuation, they don't like to do a series because uh, if they do sell to a movie, the, the names of those characters belong to the movie producer. And the nightmare, of course, was the story of uh, the author of The Godfather, Mario Puzo, who reportedly sold the movie rights to The Godfather for $50,000. <laughs> and that's all he ever got. Of course, they brought him back as screenwriter and for the, the sequels and so on, but they made $80 million, and he sold the rights to what would, they thought originally would be a low-budget movie, which turned out to be an all-time really success. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Uh, there's a standard joke that they say about Hollywood that you can use for writing, 
publishing house. The movie producer said, we did 12 major films this year, and three are blockbusters. And we're sure of that. And so the reporter says, well, which three? And he says, I wish I knew. <laughs> it's the same in publishing houses. They really don't know. Sometimes, like Tom Clancy's book, no one thought it was going to be a major bestseller. It was done by the Naval Institute that never had anything. They published pretty much factual stuff about the uh, military, and they never had anything close to that as a bestseller. So every once in a while, something uh, like that, a book comes along, it just hits the right uh, taste. And I guess uh, when we talk about mysteries, the variety of them and the appeal is endless. And that's why it goes all the way back to Edgar Allan Poe and to the great authors. And mysteries will continue to intrigue people for as long as books are published.